Again, my name is Cynthia Robinson, and at this time, we would like to invite our D.C. mayoral candidate, Mr. James Butler, to the podium. Let's give it up for him. Good afternoon, Ward 8, and all you foot soldiers for justice. I appreciate you all coming out today. I realize that you all could have been anywhere, but you've chosen to be here. So thank you so much. Uh, all too frequent a sobering topic of gun violence. I would still like to acknowledge, despite that, the wonderful host of this forum, Ms. Rhonda Hamilton, and my mother's team. I came to the city roughly 15 years ago, and like many other people, came from a different place with high hopes for the district. But we see this sobering thing of gun violence in cities all across America. And we know it's not unique to the district, but often when something's in your backyard, it concerns you most. But I know this, when you are faced with a big and bold problem, it is time for a big and bold solution. We have to believe and we have to have the hope and optimism that we can end gun violence in this city someday. We cannot continue to tolerate our young men and boys dying from a gun wound, dying in the streets, literally dying in the streets. And we also have, a, have to have a very candid conversation about race and equity. We know that all too frequently, as I've said, it's a young black man, and the narrative that the media paints to you is that this kid had no hope. We need to start there with the true dialogue about the real hope, that this is a person, that this is a life, and that black lives must be treated like every other life. Black and brown lives must be viewed like every other life. And until we have a true conversation about race and equity in this country and then this city, we will be plagued persistently with these problems. Let's not kid ourselves. We live in a city where some wards have million dollar dog parks and other wards get nothing for basic human needs. We live in a city with a $14 billion budget and at the last point in time count, there were 10,000 homeless people. We live in a city that has money for speed cameras, but in areas of high crime, they seem not to have money for crime cameras. We live in a city that can give out parking tickets in the millions of dollars, but at the same time, we can't charge these same people with reporting potholes in our streets. It is time that we stop pretending about the inequities that go on in this city. And when we can top, stop pretending, we can then bring viable solutions to our problems. Now I realize that gun violence doesn't occur in a vacuum. There are many systemic issues and reasons why gun violence occurs. Many of those are socioeconomically based and we could stand up here for weeks and I frankly wouldn't have time to address them all. But I will try to do justice one perspective of gun violence, and that is from a leadership role in this city. What leaders can do about policing to help the problem in the here and now. So I don't want anyone to misconstrue my remarks as that we are going to neglect the deeper roots of these issues, but I will address what we as leaders can do in this city in the here and now. In the past and in the present, this city has had what is known as enforcement style policing. That is, a crime happens and the police shows up. They resolve the issue, collect the bodies, put the yellow tape up, and they go away. And they don't come back until another crime happens and another body lies in the street. That is all too sad. Because folks, I know we need to, if we take things back to basics, we can end the problems we have. 
Many of you out here are old enough to remember when police actually got out of their cars. They weren't on their cell phones and they weren't texting in their patrol cars. They were out engaging the community. And yeah, you can clap, you can clap. They were out engaging the community. We need to take it back to basics. And I promise you that is the leadership that I know can change this city when we take it back to basics. Get police officers out of their cars, get them walking the streets, get them engaging the community. And how do I know that works? I can tell you, I did a little experiment. I was elected a low-level ANC commissioner a couple years back. I still work in that capacity. I live near the epicenter of where they were distributing a drug known as K2. And I watched that. And I watched it go on persistently, week after week, month after month. And I talked with the people about around it. And they said, oh, this has been going on for quite some time. They said it with the voice that you will never change it. But little did they know that the optimism and the hope that lives in me, that is the same hope and optimism that lives in you. With enough determination, we can change any problem. We can change any crisis. We can re 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 reverse any humanitarian crisis. We can do it. I told them I'm going to do something about it. Many of you know the area of Starburst Park. They used to refer to it as Scooby Park because that's where the Scooby stacks were disseminated and, and, and sold. Every day, I'd see the police out there, and I'd see the dealers. They wouldn't be there. They'd leave when the police were there. And then, when the dealers were there, the police weren't there. And I said, this is basic, this is mathematical. If we create a police presence, they're probably not gonna deal drugs. So I talked with the commander of the 5th district and I told him, I said, I want 24-hour police patrol out here. And the old age-old issue, oh, we don't have the resources. You've got the resources, you're not doing the right thing with your resources. You get them out of that car, you get them off of the bicycles, you get them off of segways, you get them out engaging the community. You give them a presence in the community and I can guarantee you things will change. I harped with them for months. And folks, I am proud to say today, things have changed. Things have ab absolutely changed. You can go out there today, and I will charge any of you to go out there today. You couldn't buy a Scooby snack if you wanted to. They have changed in a mighty way, and we ain't going back in this city. I believe that that small example that we had there, we can take it and we can apply it throughout the whole city, regarding gun violence, and we can apply it throughout the entire country. The big benefit of living in the nation's capital of the wealthiest city in the world is if you take a hard task and you solve the task and you do it right, you can be a template for the rest of the country. You can be a template for the rest of the country and even the world. We're not the first city to see gentrification like this. We're not the first city to see high crime like this. There's a city up north called New York City in 1981. Let me roll you back for just a little bit. Some of you weren't even born. <laughs> That's not a jab at my uh, young mayoral candidate there. But some of you weren't even born. But in 1981, Ed Koch was faced with a gentrifying New York City. He was also faced with uh, a very, very high crime. And what Ed Koch did was not necessarily hired more police officers. Ed Koch said, we can take our police officers and we can put them on ground. We can engage the community and we can, and he believed that we could change gun violence, gang violence in New York. And yeah, it took a lot of work, folks, but I'm here to tell you today, all change is hard. Whether you're changing your life, your mind, your body, it's hard. And changing this city in the issues of gun violence, it's going to be hard. But we have to be prepared for the task. So you foot soldiers, join with me in that task of changing this city. And know, have the optimism and hope that we can actually change gun violence in this city. It actually disappoints me that so few people are here today in this war day that is plagued most by gun violence. 
So I encourage you all to bring your friends out, bring your relatives out. Gun violence doesn't discriminate. Any of us could have been a victim of gun violence. It is by the grace of God that we are not a victim of gun violence. You can say amen. You can say amen. It's by the grace of God. Absolutely. We need, as I've also said, to engage, to go back to basics. Officer Friendly would be okay to bring him back. Thank you. Officer, going back to the basics of, of police officers, retired police officers, coaching YBL and youth baseball. Doing those things so that there's no longer this veneer of distrust between the police and the community. We need to stop changing the public safety areas of our police officers every half a month or every month. If the police officers can stay in their PSA areas for a year or more, they can get out and we can roll out our program. A program called Stop and Shake a Hand. That program is where police officers are required to get out and shake a hand. I'm Officer Joe, I'm Officer Jane. I'm here in the community to, to protect you. What this will do, it will erode that veneer of distrust. What it will also do is allow the police, this culture of no snitching that exists, allow the police to resolve criminal acts after they occur more quickly. Folks, people aren't gonna turn their guns in. I'm sorry, I don't know if anyone's surprised by it. These gun drives, I'm sorry, they don't work. Because you know what happens? The police get the guns that the criminals don't want. And our young boys and girls will continue to bleed and die in the streets. It's as simple as that. We need to police differently and deal with the great, greater systemic issues that some will, which will be addressed by my distinguished panel today. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about the mental and behavioral health component of this. I think any topic of gun violence is woefully incomplete if you don't talk about mental and behavioral health issues. But one thing I do know, I had a round table with CSOSA, which is the uh, probation services in DC, very recently, and I learned a staggering statistic that 41% of returning citizens are or have some sort of mental or behavioral health issues. But yet what I also know is there is no apparatus around or with the probation services that sees someone with a mental or behavioral health issue. So, so if you let them out of jail and you send them back in society, they've got a mental or behavioral health issue that is known to you. What do you expect to happen? You expect them to recidivate. You are setting them up for failure, folks, but this is probably what happens when you privatize their jails and it becomes a business. I know I'm telling the truth, you can clap. I know I'm telling the truth. They need customers for those privatized jails. But we need to real conversations about these things. Folks, I will continue to fight for you. Now, when I'm in the mayor's office, I will continue to fight for you. As Dr. King said, I will fight for justice until justice flows like water and righteousness, like a mighty stream. Thank you and God bless you. We'd like to thank DC mayoral candidate, Mr. James Butler. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you.